So I'd like to welcome you then to the last session of today's conference, which is a round table discussion. As you can see the round table here in front of us. <laughs> yes, yes, you can do a futuring imagination of the round table. Um, really the idea is to try to integrate the many thoughts that we've heard uh, today, during the course of the day. Um, like to integrate the normative, the analytical, the discursive framework of social futuring and the knowledge of network science, geopolitics, and social science. And so really the, what I'd like to start with is if if I could ask any one of you or each of you to reflect on on what you've heard from from your fellow speakers, um, and and what what sort of surprised you, what 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 aspects of those presentations that you've heard do you think is particularly relevant for for social futuring? Who would like to start, please? Thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed very much Laszlo's presentation, and uh, the flickering. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this unorthodox way of of using using the technology. Uh, my question or my comment on your. Uh, 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 presentation, mainly the first part of your presentation, is whether can we use some kind of an analogy of uh, success and performance at country level or at institutional level. So the ideas, the measurement methods you were using during your research when you uh, did the research on, on uh, sport achievements and, and scientific achievements can be converted into this kind of social futuring framework uh, at a higher level, how to measure the success of a country, how to measure the performance of a country in this complex way. So uh, your, your presentation was very uh, uh, stimulating uh, for us as using it, some kind of an analogy. Again, the answer is yes. What would you like me to elaborate? <laughs> <laughs> so, is this working? Yes, now it's working. Okay. So uh, obviously, you know, I I kind of showed this one in the context of scientific achievement and scientific success and scientific performance, and that's just because that's where we started this research. But I'm personally convinced that this the way we place the issues is kind of applicable much more widely and you know I we try to do that in other areas as well and I think the most important thing that comes away from that perhaps at the country and the institutional level is to kind of pay a very careful attention about what are the parameters that are intrinsically produced by that institution or the country and what are the variables that are really just a reflection on that production. So that this collective or, or versus individual qualities to be uh, placed, uh, spaced apart. It doesn't, so we should not mix them lightly, but it doesn't mean that you cannot use these the parameters jointly. You know, the fact that, that the success measures across different areas from income level to impact level to citations, you name it, right, visibility and so on. The fact that follows what we call a power law distribution, it indicates that if you want to use that one in comparison with the performance one, you have to take the logarithm of the measure rather than taking it the, the raw measure. and. And you may be able to kind of distinguish that. And if I were to do that, I would also kind of have a very careful look at saying which is a collective, which is the individual performance measure, and treat them initially separately until I understand their behavior. And of course, this raises a very important question, and I think you need to understand in the case of countries and institution, is that what is the what to what degree the per, what performance measures affect success, right? And I think in each system there's a different uh, 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 answer to that. And you know what I didn't have a chance to talk about is the role of networks. And the way I think about it is that if you measure performance very accurately, then 
it is performance to determine success or uh, reward. However, in areas where we do not have the ability to measure performance accurately, the, the value proposition is determined by networks. And like art is the most extreme example where it's very difficult to look objectively at an artwork and, de and on, in its isolation and determine what is its value. Its value only created by a reference frame to art history, to what the curators, what institutions, what museums, what galleries have exhibited the artist and what other artists have done before that and following that work, right? So, so in that case, it's really the value creation is happening through a network effect. And of course, if you think about science and most other areas from business to science, it's a mixture of two, right? There's a network effect together with the performance effect and they together determine value. So I think in your case, you will have to be very careful about the balance between them. But if we ask questions, I, can I just continue with the question so that we have... Please, yeah. please do. <laughs> right. so, so I was interested actually about your sense of resilience. And this is an area that we study a lot in my lab in the terms of network resilience. And, um, and of course, there is one usage of the language of how you think about, you know, like the resilience of a complex system, which is typically comes from ecology or engineering. And mathematically, it's really kind of to what degree it can actually survive perturbation. So if you perturb the system, we'll be able to go back to a close equilibrium to where it was before. And we also talked about kind of human resilience, and it wasn't clear to me, or maybe I just kind of didn't pay attention of how do we think about human resilience? Is there a definition of that, or is there a sense of what it is? I know we use actually that term very colloquially, that this person is very resilient, particularly when lots of bad things to happen to him or her and they're able to survive, but is that how we think about it, or there is a deeper way to think about that? Well, in fact, there is a, a rich literature on human resilience, psychological resilience, which says that uh, resilience is a type of coping with failure and trauma, and it means, uh, and how they, what is the main interesting point in, is, in it is how they measure it, because it's only interviewing how they can measure. So they are interviewing those subjects that are said or thought of as resilient. Mm -hmm. And that's why I just listed those factors. Mm -hmm. uh, what they say is that re a resilient individual gives the right explanation uh, of, a, of a happening so that he or she could be more active, proactive, mm -hmm. or, or um, yes, reactive mm -hmm. in, a, in a following situation. But there is a, a rich literature of that. Thank you. Well, Petra, you have the right to ask a question now. <laughs> <laughs> well, Peter, you just asked us to, to, to recall what was the most memorable. And, uh, well, I have to tell that this love of your own idea of Professor Friedman's uh, presentation made me so much inspired to look for how, how we could translate that idea into social futuring. Do you have any recommendations for us? Well, first, it's important to understand it's not a sentimental content. content. Love of your own is the foundation of war. Yeah. Um, I, I think th there's a fundamental difference between the way I approach the issues and social futuring. There's something in common, which is the subject matter. Mm -hmm. But when I say that I engage in forecasting, we do indexing and so on. But I am not trying to perfect men. I am not looking to make society better. I am trying to understand both what the forces are that are shaping events and to see if I could evolve them. Uh, this is somewhat different, not completely different, but somewhat different. So one of the central themes in all my work is war, because it's ubiquitous. It is the one activity outside of the household, the economy, that is a constant presence in the world. It needs understanding. So the idea of love of one's own came to the question of, for me, 
what is the foundation of community? When we say I am a Hungarian, what does that mean? What does that derive from? Why is it so natural? And I started to think about the regularity, not of society, but of an individual. What does he have in common with all others? He's born somewhere. And the place he's born has a language. The place that he's born has beliefs, religions, and a range of things. And he inherits them. And even when he overthrows them, he can't quite, can I know, because you can't quite escape being Hungarian, even if you haven't been here for many years. So the love of one's own is an attempt to explain that element which binds together people to rush machine gun bullets. Now, that's a very strange thing, but it's an empirically present thing. Um, so I, I went to this primarily to try to explain some terrible things okay, that I don't think I can get away from. The index that we're building in geopolitics is interesting because what we've tried to do is index everything rather than having quantitative values. It is primarily an expert system where the experts themselves are uncertain. So the idea is to build enough data into it that the errors kind of equal themselves out and turn everything into it. We have three basic areas, uh, uh, war, military, economic, political, with a technological one. And these are three asymmetric trees that must interact. So I have to have common values to do that. To do this, I have to lie a lot to claim I know things that I don't know, but which I have to know in order to be able to operate in this level. And this goes back to the question of love of one's own. How do I, I don't know how to quantify that. I know how to describe it. I can know how to operationalize it, I think, but I don't know how to quantify it because it also is a factor which is truly unknown. If you ask most people how they came to believe something, the self-awareness that is there or there in another person is missing. It's so fundamental. And I, I bring this up in the context of a model, because how do you take something for which there is no outside validation, or very little, or you can only get that outside validation if you essentially inform the player that he has to have a perception. And that, of course, poisons the whole thing. But I think one of the things that to discuss in you know, future, futuring, if you will, is how do we select the topics that are to be futured, and what rigor do we apply to the selection of topics? Not, not within them, but how, how did you pick that? And why didn't you pick this? And things of that sort. That, that, anyway. Well, maybe Janusz, that's a good place for you to continue. I mean, that was the original question that you raised uh, this morning. Shall I repeat my presentation? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would, uh, uh, actually, I would ask questions from you which is related to this uh, topic. And uh, uh, one reason why I am so happy to have Mr. Pink here, because we are kind of stuck, not only in methodology, but how can we apply the social future in concept in other cultures? And we talked about the rector, talked about the Tao, uh, uh, Confucius came up, and uh, when we start working together, it will be interesting to, to cast a light on the topics from that angle. And I'm really grateful that you are here as, as a person who has deep knowledge in the ancient Chinese culture, but who studied Western philosophy, whose hero is Immanuel Kant. So it will be very interesting for the applicability, and uh, I'm looking forward to, to mutually define the unity of order. What is the basis? Coming back to your question, George. And what is goodness? And that, in this morning, that was, or this afternoon, it was 
really interconnected with what Laci said, Laszlo said, every time when I go to Boston or we meet here with Laci or, or Robert, uh, uh, his, his, his colleague, Peter, 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 Peter uh, he's not here though. Okay. <laughs> you can say what you want. What you that you like me. <laughs> so, so the each time, Lotzi or Peter comes up with some studies showing that the facts, what we experienced in the past, predictable for customer, and that comes back to the question of free will whether we have a choice. Here is a country, Hungary, more than 1,000 years old, uh, constituted entity. Or the United States, which is 300 years old, uh, constituted entity. Or China, 5,000 years. <laughs> Will we all be here in 1,000 years down the road? So it's, it's the goodness which people are ready to defend, sacrifice for, Secondly, the predictability. And thirdly, what George raised, Machiavelli. Or we can use Thomas Aquinas for the king of Cyprus, which was the same uh, recipe, which was given literally to the king of Cyprus how to gain power, how to stay in power, and how to preserve the power, power and give it over. So these issues were interlinked in, in mind and I had so much food for thought that I cannot tell you. And looking forward to understand better other lights on goodness and order, how far we have freedom, or Lotzi knows what's going to happen, just he is polite enough not to tell us. <laughs> or is it Thomas Aquinas with his philosophical background or Machiavelli? with his philosophical background, will rule. So, Wang Ping, what thoughts do you have? Thank you again. Uh, for me today, of course, it's always uh, enlightening to listen to uh, Friedman's uh, speech and share his ideas. Uh, but for me, it's also the first time to listen to your, especially the first and the last sentence performances for me and uh, successes for us. Uh, but the most very impressive is actually for all the group you are working together for this social future. It's more than just an idea now already very sort of comprehensive uh, analytical framework. But the one thing which also I myself have been suffering from and I'd like to ask my uh, colleagues here is how such a new analytical uh, framework or approach to uh, our futuring, let's say human or social futuring, can not only, not only um, understand better uh, humans as individuals, future, but also communities, especially you have and, uh, highlighted the importance of this uh, ongoing, even with some sort of new forms, ongoing geopolitics, therefore uh, say still nation states even I argue that they are not the, not the only actors, but they are still the very powerful and important actors, either big or small, older and new. But the how say, such a, a social future analysis can also apply to uh, not only individuals or smaller uh, communities, but such a big uh, issue, so the world order. That's my question. Thank you. Who would like? Who would like? Yes. Well, we deliberately decided not to deal with the individuals. Mm -hmm. We are dealing with social entities, uh, social personas. Pers 
meaning that they constitute themselves. They, they are self-conscious and have goals and have imagination and they want to do something. And actually, this comes back for George's comments that how come that the entity can trigger individuals to give their life? Which is an interesting question. We don't have this as a task because it's a huge philosophical uh, endeavor. But we would be happy to connect the concept of good life in a unity of order and the many facts that we know from statistical databases, from network sciences. So basically, how to, how to pick the right indicators filtered through the pillars that inform and help us to understand how far we can kind of map out a good social circumstance for people. And obviously, individuals do it, most probably rulers in the first place and then other persons. We Hungarians, we are accustomed to make sure that our own little garden is undisturbed as individuals and as Carpathian basin or, or so. So that we, we walk the talk. Just something to add. In a way, we are dealing with individuals as long as they are social. So we conceive of the individual as inherently social. Yes. And that individual is interesting for us. For that's that I have to defend my figures because there was a dot for the individual as well. But yes, I think your question is very, very relevant. And what is measurable at the level of the individual may be very, very, I mean, impossible to measure at a societal level. Yes, like explanatory style or the psychological features. Now that is what Janusz is talking about, trying to figure out what factors and what levels are truly relevant that may mirror all these multi-layer layers or levels that we are dealing with. But now, at, now we are at this stage. Yeah, so we are, this, this, this is a question in a way. Thank you. Well, since, since last one, I was all the answers. George. Yes. I, we talk about the good life. We begin necessarily with the Greeks. We know two things, that Aristotle made his first virtue, courage. And that Plato spoke of thumos, the excitement on the battlefield when he saw the bodies. We know that the Greeks did not see war as a disease. They saw it as an opportunity to the highest form of humanity. So if being a political animal was the highest form of humanity, they also understand war was part of that. So there are multiple notions of the good life. Out of the Enlightenment grew the idea that the good life was one without fear of death. Uh, Ultimately, Kant was making the case that that was the problem. We know that the Greeks that many of us here admire, I heard that, had a very different view of that. I think this is important to the model because when we talk about futuring and exclude the possibility or the reality of war, we're falsifying. Uh, you know, here we sit, two friends, from two countries, I hope we don't go to war. I don't think we will go to war. But it is a real, it is not a trivial matter. So, but it goes to the heart of the, what, you're, what we're going to do here, which is we are deciding what the good is. And the good is not self-evident. And particularly, we heard the speech today about, you know, the Greeks and their virtues. And if you read um, the Iliad, we get a very different sense of, of the good. So I think, for my part, I mean, I'm a latecomer to this and not you know, part of it, really. But I think we have to consider that be very careful not to create a futuring model that is predeterminedly ideological that it somehow take into account the fact that not everybody agrees that doing this is good. And now we get into the problem of deciding what is good, but it's not a problem, because I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we totally agree. 
we're all tired out there. That was a very funny joke. <laughs> Zoltan. Reflecting on your question, uh, uh, I would say that, of course, in our analysis, the focus is on different kinds of social entities, whether it is a family, a friendship network, or even a nation or a country. But we never forget that these social entities are consist of, ultimately, individuals. And in some cases, uh, when we are trying to catch social futuring, maybe that one or some individuals will do things which will help for the whole social entity to be futurable. In other cases, a critical mass of individuals needed to result the same. But we focus on social entities and sometimes we focus also on champions or one champion, some champions on a critical mass of champions. Uh, our colleague uh, Bala Sepe, she wrote a paper about the key figures of social futuring and he uh, uh, tried to conceptualize this aspect of our uh, 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 research agenda. But of course, uh, going back to uh, the point uh, uh, which was raised by uh, George, the conceptual or analytical framework and the normative framework is not integrated uh, according to my perception uh, at the moment, uh, finally. What I'm trying to say is that uh, First, we have to uh, create or develop the social futuring index on an analytical way, on methodology and on measurement. And then we can say that there are uh, futureable social entities, whether they are countries, and there are other countries which are less futureable in our terms. And of course, parallel, we can ask the question, whether is it desirable that changes or not. So these are two separate questions, but of course, if we make clear and transparent our standards, normative standards, as it was explicated by Anna Sture and it was explicated by Zoltan Abraham, another colleague of us who wrote a paper about uh, similar issues, we, we can make judgments as well. But it does not mean that this is the only judgment uh, which can be made. But uh, uh, I, I, I think that uh, these two aspects of our, our project is, is fair because we don't confuse the two questions. On the one hand, we are methodologically and conceptually and theoretically want to uh, construct the index. And at the same time, we have clear standards, eth ethical or, or value uh, standards, which are clear. We, we put them on the table. Everyone can, can read and understand and say, OK, I can expect, or I have other, other uh, standards. So this, this is uh, the, the story I, I, I would summarize in, 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 in a roundtable discussion. May I ask you, um, George gave us a cautionary note um, saying that you know, we should be careful uh, about being too ideologue. Um, what other um, advice would you have for the group in going forward? in terms of social futuring? What should we be worried about? What could go wrong in this process? And your involvement would be very interesting because really the more pitfalls we can avoid, the better we are because we save time. And we had, we had talked about this 
several times. And I would just highlight two pitfalls we, that we identified and I think solved. One is any type of social engineering. We don't want to tell anybody how to live. This is the basic assumption that people have to manage their own life and our role is to put on the table uh, a way of looking at life that they can consider as an alternative. So no social engineering, therefore no ideology. This is why, as I said, we put everything on the table. Uh, the, the second one just escaped me, so I will give the floor for the others and I will come back. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Any advice? Well, I guess in, in the language of biology, what we're trying to do is find a biomarker and not a drug, right? So, and the challenge what you have is that what is the right biomarker for, for the problems that you're asking. Now, with that, you're going to make a judgment, right? Because, uh, because you will have to decide what, are, what is that you're going to leave in and what you're going to knock out. In biological systems, we have the luxury to say, I want to get the biomarker to indicate if you are ill, and I have objective measures to see if you are ill or healthy. And the biomarker has to predict and reflect and predict that, right? Uh, here, however, it's up to interpretation what the healthy and the, the and the disease case is. So that's where you're going to have to make lots of choices. That I will be very curious how you're going to do that. <laughs> that's one aspect. And the same, the other aspect that you have with biomarkers in your systems as well is that offer the key variables that really reflect the mechanism of the problem are not observable to you. So now you're going to try to actually infer, uh, you know, the, uh, the consequences of that non-observable mechanism through observing variables that to some degree reflect that or not. These are problems that, you know, people in dynamical systems have been deal dealing with and so on. So there are methodologies to go after if you have sufficient data. But I guess we're all going to be watching with curiosity how one can pull that one off at the scale you are envisioning. We are relying on you and your... <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Any other advice? Well, I mean, <laughs> one of the problems is that most of the world is not quantifiable. Mm -hmm. Love, mm -hmm. uh, rage, I mean, these are very real things. They're vital things for social society. I mean, we can rig a value for them, mm -hmm. but it's a rigging a value, and sometimes useful. We're in a space where we deal with non-quantifiable things. So, for example, in military modeling, how do you model morale? Now, we know it's a critical function in war. How do you model it? You can leave it out because you can't quantify it, but then you're falsifying reality. It's very important that we understand what is quantifiable, what isn't quantifiable, and then there's a fundamental problem. Because it's heterogeneous, war, economy, what have you, okay? You now have to find a common currency to link them together. So first you have to determine what can be quantified, what can't be quantified, find a methodology for dealing the non-quantifiable, then linking them across, because you want an index, across the border. Technically, this is what we call hard. <laughs> <laughs> it, it can be done, I think, and we're, I'm, we're trying to do it for geopolitics. But it requires very deliberate, careful judgment. Uh, it's what we call, in our field, quantitative, qualitative judgment model. Quantitative judgment model. That means we make up numbers. But in your job, in job and, and uh, organizations like armies or, or bu uh, bureaucracies, they don't disclose everything what they know, as Mr. Ping uh, finished his uh, presentation. There's a difference between knowing and talking. Uh, what we try to do is to be as transparent in our both normative and methodologic ways of doing things. And 
the reason why we are doing it, because we are curious. We want to know what are the alternatives, and we will be the first who will change the weight of one indicator in the overall uh, 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 equation. And also, I guess all of us talked about the complexity of the world. We have to do something that is comprehensible. Simple enough, because we don't want to do something that is academically sound, but people cannot digest. It should be socially meaningful. Meaningful, which is very much related to goodness. At, at my company, we have a saying, be stupid. In other words, do not leap to the you know, extreme. Just look at the obvious thing in front of you. I don't know the... Um, I, I don't know the data on Chinese air-to-air -air missiles, although if you'd want to tell me, I'd be grateful. <laughs> but, but I'm sure you have some. And without knowing that sort of detailed information, I can begin to create operational things. We don't, there are many things in the world we can't find out, but we can look at them behaviorally if you want. So all of this is possible, but it's important to sit down first and, and sweat it. But the principle you had here is exactly what we, we call being stupid. Yes. You know, um, you, we are not going to occupy China. Don't be stupid and start planning occupying China. <laughs> China is not going to attack us. It's not going to happen. This is a very stupid way to look at the world, but it's a very good way. It's a good way to start. Yeah, we are back to the ancient Greeks, Socrates. <laughs> Only thing I know but I don't. Yes, but he was lying. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you have already said it, but I, I should, uh, again, this is a kind of early uh, reminding or even warning. Uh, on the one side, of course, the world is getting more uh, complicated, comprehensive. And Sophisticated, but on the other side, whatever measurement index must be as simple as possible. Um, when I say this, of course, you already have emphasized just now, because uh, again, taking the human indicators as an example, um, even when they already feel unhappy with only GDP plus income. But it's so hard to even add one more indicator. So after so many years spending so many millions of dollars, many studies, they finally got the two health and education. But even for then what kind of indicators to measure the health is not easy. And by the end, it's uh, still only more to measure individual well-beings than the state. Even they want to compare, therefore, the different states. Um, so I think for social filtering, as George has also said, uh, what are the um, actual measurable? Uh, secondly, to be as simple as possible, and meaningful but in the meantime, of course. And suddenly, uh, you have presented very well uh, on the analytical framework. So the next step will be how, from this kind of framework, down to some easy indicators. Mm. Tomorrow we will. Tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow. Tomorrow morning. Why we need Tomorrow. Yes, yes, yes. I, I would add uh, one more. Uh, kind of pitfall what we talked about and uh, you were kind of alluded to uh, this as well that look at this stage Chinese American Hungarian American and uh, in Budapest we don't want to be exotic we know that we cannot be fully universal but for an extent, we can pay attention to, to fringes, but we have to say something meaningful for 
as wide as possible audiences and social entities, for example, in countries. There will be always countries which somehow cannot find their place and they either survive or disappear, as so many even nations disappear. But again, it's not a Hungarian project. It's not an exotic European Union project. <laughs> it's socially meaningful for people in the National Advanced Studies Center in Bangalore, India, or in Mexico, or in Washington, D.C., and hopefully in, in Austin as well. So th this was a pitfall what we could have fallen into. But uh, if we start shifting there, just raise your hand and say, hey, wait a minute. Well, this is a good opportunity to raise your hand if you have uh, any questions. Um, let's give the chance for the very smart audience to ask their questions. Everybody's... No questions? You mean the less smart audience is not a doctor? No. <laughs> no. Okay. Any final thoughts? I think what Janos finished with is, is a, oh, there is a question. Yes, please. Two. Oh, fantastic. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Um, John Mueller from um, Washington, D.C. Um, this has been a marvelous um, conference so far, and I thank you all for your contributions. Um, my first observation has to do with uh, the admirable, admirable humility that you have shown in the project in not claiming too much, but I think that you can probably claim more than you do. Um, my first observation is that, and this is apropos of the discussion earlier, um, distinguishing between individuals and social entities and I would suggest that there is not a single individual in this room. There are only persons. Mm. The difference between a person and an individual is that a person has relations to other persons, whereas an individual is, um, in concept, self-created. And uh, so I would suggest that uh, an approach of personalism implies separate human beings who are, are related to one another. Uh, and I would ask Janos, since um, he has thought much about this, whether perhaps St. Augustine has not offered a solution, even in mathematical terms, to answer um, George Friedman's uh, concern that uh, some of these things are not quantifiable. Uh, I think I guess I guess I might have given you an argument on that. So I think both is true. If if you look at these persons and these persons, we have our self consciousness. We are individuals and we try to defend it. We are intellectually, physically, we are individuals. It's really hard to tell me what I should do. <laughs> but we are persons, and, and yes, John, you are right. We've been thinking about this, and a good part, it, there was no time to explain it today. Zoli gave me only 20 minutes. But uh, uh, in my paper and in Abraham Zoli's uh, paper, we explain the concept of person, and this is why we came up with the four fe features. Attachment can be com comprehended only if there are at least two persons. There is no attachment otherwise. Love your own. Second, care. Obviously you care about yourself, but you care about somebody else. If you care about only yourself, that doesn't have a real meaning. Uh, contentment. Contentment is a comparative term. 
There is no contentment if there is no another person. And security, you want to be secure or extend your defending arm to another person. So we took into consideration the, the concept of, of, of a person going back to Aristotle for that matter, who talked about, actually in Italian, person comes from personare, which says, and it comes from the ancient Greek, talking to each other. Either, each other. And we elaborated on it, and we have to make it clear all the time, we should have used human person, not necessarily as an individual. Thank you for your comment. About this, yeah. Precisely, um, for according to Confucius, his keyword, or amongst the many concepts he has developed, the most important concept, literally, is two persons. Yeah. For these two persons, he meant unity, order, harmony, rights, um, uh, identity. So all of this, but in Chinese, he combined the two characters into one, and literally two persons. And there was another question. Uh, thank you, uh, Andrew Comstey uh, from London, Chairman of Enterprise Forum. Um, really, this is to address the question: How does the organization go forward from here. And I, I have to say it's been a privilege being here at the first international event. I think it's been outstanding. So congratulations to everybody who's pulled this together. Enterprise Form, my organization, has been going just over 20 years. And we've been doing huge amounts of navel gazing as to how we got to 20 years mm -hmm. uh, and, and why that might have happened. Um, and we came to four conclusions. One was have a very clear view of who, you, who we were, real clarity of purpose, thought, and I think you've got that exactly. Second is to surround yourself with amazing people, because uh, ultimately that makes one look even better. Uh, and I think you've made a great start there. I think the second thing also we found is don't be too affected by noises off stage. Um, it's a loud world out there and it's very easy to be diverted from focus. So I think sticking to what you know to be right. But finally, be, be violently open to innovation and new thinking and new ideas because things do change. You're all looking into the future and innovation is important. And that's how we got to 20 years. So I don't know if that's helpful, but I'll just share that with you. Andrew, it's a great help and uh we are in the red in financing. So an enterprise forum on our next roadshow in London <laughs> is the perfect venue to explain our project. Thank you. You put it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I think um, it is time now to close today's conference. Um, I think you will agree with me that our speakers, our panelists, deserve a big round of applause. They have, they have certainly stimulated our thinking today, and uh, I honestly believe that uh, you, you also deserve a big round of applause for sticking with us. <laughs> and for those who are coming to tomorrow's workshop, um, get a good night's sleep. <laughs>